Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Vanessa Rich, and I'm Deputy Commissioner for Children's Services here in the city of Chicago. Uh, this afternoon, we're starting an exciting series of um, educational and informational opportunities to do some exploring of Reggio. And so I'm going to stop talking <laughs> and turn this over to our extremely capable team um, who will tell you, uh, first we'll have Victor Santiago, who gets here with the city to tell you how to ask questions, tune in, to do a technical chat, and then we'll turn it over to our instructional guests who will take the lead. So Victor, first you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who've been at a webinar with us before, it's the same drill. Um, Essentially, there are three different ways to ask a question on today's webinar. There is you can raise your hand up and type a question and type a question in into the chat box or into the question box, or you can go ahead and raise your hand and we'll try to unmute you. And you can go ahead and talk directly to the group and ask your question. Um, we'd like you to preferably dial in using the dial in, and that way we can avoid any issues if you have a slow internet connection. Uh, to your mic and speakers. Okay, uh, that's it. Enjoy the webinar. Okay. So, um, <coughs> well, maybe we should first introduce the team. I'm Karen Hay, Kristen Rizalas, Janice Wood, and Kimberly Cotton. Okay. And Please be patient with us all, because this is the first time we've ever done this before. Um, I wanted to say that, first of all, we're going to show three PowerPoints. That one of the PowerPoints, there's going to be an interactive part uh, where we're going to give you a little time to explore shadows or light. Um, and that will be the second one. So I think we should start with the first PowerPoint. And I want to thank everybody. I know this was kind of very fast track uh, notice. And I appreciate everyone responding so quickly and wanting to be involved in this project, because I think it's an exciting project, even though there is a huge time crunch with the project. So do we have the, there we go. It's, it's, it's not that one. <laughs> We're not starting with that one first. Okay. I think the other thing we want to make sure that people know is that this uh, what will be taped. It's being recorded, so if you um, miss some of it, or if you have friends or colleagues who want to join us as we move along, they can uh, catch up um, by going back and viewing this first. Um, right. There we go. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to talk, or actually Janice and I are going to talk about an overview of the whole project, because it, it's more than just today. Um, the light and shadow project we see as a catalyst for exploration, expression, and understanding. And it's an invitation for people to participate, study, document, understand, and celebrate. And celebrate is going to be kind of more near the end. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So also this light and shadow project is influenced by the Reggio Emilia approach uh, to learning. It, it, we're trying to see how we can adopt and adapt some of those principles. We all know that we're not Reggio programs, but we also know that Reggio is very um, focused on this idea of paying close attention to your context, to, to the child's context, to the program's context. And so I think this could be a really interesting study to pursue in our different contexts throughout the country. So I just want to highlight a few um, principles of the Reggio approach. Maybe Janice and I could do some of these together. Okay. You want to start with the Sure. Okay. And so uh, adopting and adapting Reggio Amelia principles with emphasis on children as <coughs> active protagonists uh, and um, the hundred utilizing the hundred languages and uh, really listening to children's ideas, their thoughts, uh, learning as a 
uh, process of individual and group construction, uh, educational research, uh, really uh, understanding and listening to uh, the experiences that children are having, and then uh, constructing a way to research those thoughts and ideas. Educational documentation, uh, and the observation of interpretation and projection, uh, environment, spaces, and relations, uh, professional development, and assessment. Okay. And, and one that I see is really, really important is, is participation. That whole idea that we're all going to be participating together, but children participate together, families participate together, teachers participate. Everyone's a participant, everyone has a voice, everyone has a perspective as they work together. So we're just going to talk a little bit about the logistics of the, of the project. Um, Janice and I are going to be the project coordinators while Jesus, Kristen, and Kim are team members and we're all facilitators in some way, shape, or form. The participants of this project are, for this webinar and this overall project are Early Head Start and Head Start programs. And the overall project goal is to promote, study, document, and communicate young children's learning experiences. And then, Janice, you want to talk about the objectives? Sure. So um, with this uh, Light and Shadow project, teachers will provide provocations for children to explore and experiment, problem solve, collaborate, and communicate. Along with that, facilitators will support teachers in promoting more complex learning experiences and documenting the learning processes. Teachers and facilitators will document and make learning experiences and strategies visible to others. And children will extend their ability to explore and experiment, problem solve, collaborate, and communicate, which all serve as foundations for more academic, creative, and complex and engaged learning. So with all of that, uh, we want you to know that uh, this uh, opportunity is for children to uh, explore and for you to uh, really learn with them uh, and really understand uh, their thoughts and their ideas is you're making these experiences available to them. Okay, so the, the, the scope of the project and some of the components and sequence, we're going to talk about each of those. Um, they're going to be a series of five webinars studying light and shadows. We're going to be working on gathering documentation and then the big thing is we're going to be working on creating an exhibit and possibly other forms of display of the work, um, and the, hopefully having the exhibit be at the National Head Start um, Conference in late March, early April. So this is a timeline for the, these learning experiences, and that's why I say that it's kind of a, a crunch here, because we're on a, a fast track to try to gather this. Um, but in the beginning, we begin with an overview of the project, which we're talking about today, an introduction to light and shadows, the shadow exploration, some dialogue with questions, talk about how to gather documentation, and then talk about provocations for the next session. <clears throat> um, and then our next session, we're going to be, the, the next couple sessions, it's really going to be gathering documentation, talking about it, asking questions, developing further provocations and collecting data for the next two sessions. And then the fourth session, we really need to work on gathering documentation in terms of telling the story. Yes? Uh, when you say provocation, what do you mean? Well, when I say provocation, I mean um, offering challenges to children, trying to go beyond what they already know or what they already do in, in a way, though, that um, paying attention to their context and their interests. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then the, the, the last session is really going to be um, pulling together some kind of presentation of your work 
Um, and, and we're going to try to get your work. It's going to be sent to us, and then we're going to try to develop an actual exhibit and then send it to Washington so it could be presented. So you can see how it's kind of on a fast, fast track. Um, and this just kind of gives the dates in terms of what we're trying to do, in terms of we're gathering the work, we're looking at the work. Um, but by really by mid-March, we need to be getting the work looking at um, putting the exhibit together, looking at packing it, shipping it by the end of March, and then um, setting it up. So one thing I wanted to say, too, is remember that we're looking at manufactured, or some people refer to it as artificial light and shadows. And that's, that's actually an example. I don't know if somebody from Tucson is here, but from the Head Start program in Tucson example of artificial light. But we're also looking at natural light and shadows. And then sometimes we're looking at a mixture of manufactured and natural light. And so um, we're going to set up some possible provocations for you all um, at the end of this session. But for now, I just want to ask and see if, that, if people do have any questions just about the overall project before we go into light and shadow. We like questions. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie Gray Hill. Hello, Jackie. Jackie Gray Hill. Do you have a question? Looks like you had your hand raised. Uh, probably your mic and speakers are not uh, compatible with this program. So if you can go ahead and, and type your question, I can go ahead. You can go ahead and read it to the group, and they can go ahead and uh, answer it. Uh, Eileen Hughes, I think that we the same for you. Uh, we don't have any type questions right now. So, but they're going to try and. They'll try and type They'll try and type them in? Yeah. Okay. I, I especially want to hear Eileen's question. <laughs> okay. OK, so let's, let's go on with the present. So we need to go on with the next PowerPoint. which is Overview of the Light and Shadows. And this is the Light and Shadow Project Final One. Right? Or do you have another part two here? No. No. Okay. No, it's not that not one. Not that one. Not that one. No. The next one? The one above the Light and Shadow Project yeah. Final Okay. Okay. <coughs> sure. So first we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, why to explore Light and Shadow. Um, so just a little bit about uh, what are some of the reasons you might want to explore with children. Uh, light is fascinating and seems to have life, life of its own. Shadows, too, are fascinating and can appear, expand, decline, and eventually disappear all within a day. Children can explore shadows and see how they're created. Um, also, throughout this process, you know, we talk about inquiry a lot. So children are encouraged to ask questions. You know, where does light come from? How do you create a shadow? How big is a shadow? Um, so children have the capability to ask questions and discover answers to their own questions. Um, they will be learning through play on how to be a researcher. And then if you can maybe read the bullet again, also. Oh, yeah. OK. So uh, light and shadow are very accessible materials. They present themselves around us in so many different forms. Uh, something which both children and adults are drawn to. Uh, they cultivate curiosity and imagination. Uh, they cause you to think about reality versus imagination. They can be manipulated in many different ways. Uh, they are both something natural and or can be manufactured. Uh, also, they promote logical thinking about cause and effect. Uh, and then finally, explorations of light and shadow can strengthen observation skills. We do have a couple of questions. Okay. Great. Um, 
Is there a way to watch the webinar at a different time of day? I am, uh, we are recording the webinar, and it will be posted onto our website, childrenserviceinchicago.com. Um, we will have access to the PowerPoint or handouts of the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so in general, people can do download this whole presentation. Right. That would be correct. We'll, we'll have everything for download on our website. Those are the only questions we have. Okay. So far. All right. I think we're ready for the next slide. Okay. So, uh, using light in our own language. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, using light in our language. Um, these are just examples of how we refer to light both metaphorically and literally. So, in the limelight, um, you know, to shed some light on or give, you know, um, further emphasis on to be enlightened or to be you know, well learned or very aware um, to see the light. Um, light at the end of the tunnel, sort of a metaphor for hope, guiding light um, to light up and to begin to see the light. Okay. Okay. And then we just wanted to share some images of both natural and artificial light again for inspiration. as well as sharing some quotes from various uh, writers, authors, artists, and teachers. Um, maybe we can each read one of these. Sure. Maybe. So I'll start. Keep your face always towards the sunshine, and shadows will fall behind you. That was Walt Whitman. All right. And then find beauty not only in the thing itself, but in the pattern of the shadows, the light and dark, which that thing provides by Junichoro Kandazaki. Who's an author? <laughs> yeah. Very good. <laughs> Kim, did you want to read that? There are dark shadows on the earth, but its lights are stronger in the contrast. Charles Dickens. Fear is a large shadow, but he himself is small. And this is Ruth Zendler. <laughs> There's no shadow without reality. The shadow is a reality. Francois Maurice? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Rock? I'm not sure. So hopefully um, over the next number of images and words, we can give you some ideas and examples of possibilities that you may be able to pursue with light and shadow in the classroom, in the school, and even beyond. Magical religious beliefs myths, superstitions, and taboos referring to shadows exist worldwide. And this certainly provides a clue to the interest shown in shadows everywhere in every period. This is a quote from the book, Everything Has a Shadow Except for Ants. And I think it speaks a lot to the widespread interest of shadows and the various contexts to which it reaches. So thinking about opportunities that might present themselves in our environment, thinking about how natural light might creep through different patterns in glass, and then the patterns that it might create on the wall or on the carpeting. Also thinking about our window coverings and how those window coverings affect and impact the light and shadow. And anyone can jump in if there's anything else that you see that. Also they're thinking about, sorry, the, the different age groups, right? On the, the top, that's a, um, a toddler classroom, so thinking about how toddlers might have access to different aspects of light and shadow. And then one of the other images in it is in a common room, right? So thinking about how this isn't just in classrooms, but can also be in common spaces. And then I just want to add that uh, the possibility of rich, rich uh, conversations with children, I think, uh, direction of light, you know, um, you know, we think about the serial repetition that we see in the patterns of, you know, coming in, the beams of light in the windows. You know, and I, just, I think about uh, light is ephemeral, you know, it changes through time. You know, at one point in the day it can be, you know, if you're looking at your classroom environment, it's in one place, and throughout the day it can change. So all these patterns can shift and alter and um, permutate, you know, they can change and develop. And also to think about the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, while children are exploring uh, the playground, uh, there are many possibilities to explore life. 
thinking about very simple opportunities, um, here's an example of a small light box, in which case a plexiglass, a piece of plexiglass was placed on top of it, and children had the opportunity to paint with acrylic paint. And thinking about how that light source impacts the ideas of light and dark, and how you can start to see colors in a different way. I think, you know, really, uh, I think also, too, I think it pushes this idea of color. And, you know, when we think of finger paint, uh, one thing that it's thought of as a very uh, mundane kind of everyday material, but, you know, through light, it's, it's a very transparent kind of paint. And um, I think it's very interesting to work with it, you know, using the element of light. Thinking about how we can enhance those kind of possibilities within our own environment. In this case, this is a light table, and above it, they mounted a small awning so that it would cast a shadow over the light table and further enhance the light source. And you can also notice the small round mirrors that were mounted on the wall behind it just to even further enhance the, the reflection in the light. Looking again at opportunities for natural light that may just spontaneously present themselves within a space on the right. And on the left, thinking about materials that we might offer children in various spaces to interact with artificial light. And in that case, it's three children in front of a, a light table using various uh, semi-translucent, semi-transparent materials and seeing how, how the light impacts the color and how the light impacts the material. I think what's very helpful during processes like these is if the teacher is available to capture what children are saying or writing down what they're saying, either in a video or tape recorder, because I would say that these moments kind of guide the experience or can guide the experience. I think also, you know, in these, in these pictures and also in the next slide, I think they're <clears throat> uh, wonderful opportunities for children to actually um, control the, you know, these elements, you know, creating shadows, making shadows move. Um, uh, you know, it's sort of using uh, shadows and light as a material, if you will. So, very powerful stuff. Again, looking at opportunities for children at different ages. That was a, a provocation, if you will, on the left, <laughs> where a, an overhead projector was set up and some small blocks, those uh, semi-transparent colored blocks, were placed on the overhead projector. And then there were, there were other materials nearby. And the, the projector was turned on. And the toddlers immediately went up to the projection and began to interact with it. And then they moved back and forth between the, the light projector and the wall where the projection was actually taking place. And you can see in the one child's hand, he has an actual three-dimensional object that he's now having that interact with this two-dimensional projection on the wall. Thinking, as Jesus mentioned before, the idea of being able to manipulate shape and change light, um, looking at a very simple source of artificial light, a flashlight, um, and thinking about children working with others, children working with parents, children working with teachers, or children working with other teachers, or excuse me, with other children. With that, with that material. This is an experience where a number of parents, teachers, and children came together and they had experienced or had been through a, an hour uh, exploration of light and shadow. And at the end, they all met in a large room and everybody was asked to choose a particular light source that they might find interesting. So some of them chose flashlights, some of them chose headlamps, and everybody was asked to point their light source up at the ceiling and to make their light dance. So for a little while on the left, you can see the light was dancing all over the ceiling. It was almost a magical space in this room for a while. And then all of a sudden, we challenged them a little further and asked them if they could dance and move all of their lights to the same place so that they could make one giant light together. And that's what you see on the right. What's great about this is um, the possibility of the home connection, you know, uh, bridging the, the, you know, the gap between home and school, and you know, flashlights, window lights, um, shadows. These are all things that parents can create with children. And what's really rich about that uh, experience also is the dialogue that can happen. You know, the theories children might have about how the uh, shadows are created, um, the theories they might have about how light is projected, and uh, 
um, interfered with. Um, this is nothing that um, is exclusive to a school. It can be done at home very easily. And parents can also research with their children Along. at home as well. And actually, one of the parents who was involved in this afterwards came back to the school and said, um, how meaningful this experience was for them, not just because they had time to explore with their child in this way, but also that their child had been very afraid of the dark. And now when the child went home, she liked using a flashlight at home because she knew she could manipulate both the light and the dark on her own. Um, this is an example of teachers exploring light and shadow at a, at a teacher workshop. And here again is the play of three-dimensional objects as well as projection, and the teachers use different constructive materials to build and create structures, and then they use the overhead projector to add complexity to those structures with other three-dimensional materials as well as with just cellophane and color blocks. Thinking about how we represent our ideas and theories and how children represent their ideas and theories and giving them the opportunity to do so with various materials, or as was mentioned before, the many languages. And here a child represented his idea of a shadow. And he said, my shadow looks like me, but it's brown or black, I think. And you can see that there's the actual child and then his shadow right next to him, and the movement really mirrors one another, right? Even the kick of the foot, right, looks very, very similar. The expression, the curvature of the body. I think also, it, you know, the disillusion between reality and fantasy is so interesting for children. Uh, when you look at children's thinking, um, it almost doesn't matter that something is uh, real or not in some ways. I think you can personify shadows. You know, they they can have a personality. They can have an identity as they do with this child. And I think that, you know, through this uh, partial dramatic play, if you will, children are really learning a lot about um, many things around the world, in this case, a lot having to do with science. So there's a lot of learning, you know, connected to, to the fantasy play, and I think that's a wonderful thing. So now we just wanted to share, um, this is actually just a small scene or a small section from a longer study that took place a number of years ago. And this particular study started with an exploration of light and shadow, and it developed into a longer term experience where children went um, out into the school and into the surrounding environment and really explored letters in the environment and the alphabet in the environment. But we're just going to show the beginning portion of this and how that all started. So this was a dialogue that, that a teacher had um, gathered during an experience when the children were exploring light and shadow. And the teacher said, what is a shadow? Jessica, it's dark, and when there's light, the shadow comes. When it's dark, you can't see your shadow. Brandon, it's a shadow when the light is out. Jaden, it's a shadow when you stand up. And then the teacher returned to the children, and she asked, well, what is a shadow made of? And Bobby said, like a circle, and he shows his head's shadow. I move my body like my elbow. David said, light, and Brandon said, of my hand. So after the teacher gathered this dialogue, um, she shared it in, in, a, in a curriculum meeting or in a meeting where we were gathered together to look at the documentation that was gathered from the classroom. And she also shared this image of this one child. And what was so special about this one child was that as they were exploring light and shadow, this child went and she found a couple of blocks in the classroom. And she put those blocks together on an overhead projector. And she came over to the teacher and she told the teacher, look it, I made an E. And she was so excited about her letter that she had made and that she had projected onto the wall that she wanted to make sure there was a photo taken of her for what she was doing. So it was thought that it might be interesting to pursue the idea of the alphabet and letters through light and shadow. And after this first child came and showed her letters, a few other children spontaneously went and found other materials to create different letters. And then it kind of caught on, and the teachers began to challenge all children to choose a letter and then find some material that they wanted in the classroom to represent that letter. And you could see some of them are, are like transparent uh, colored blocks. One, the B on the bottom is actually remnants of clay that the children had been using when they were exploring clay and it had hardened. And the O is a doily that was in the dramatic play area. And then the D is just two blocks put together. So I think it's 
it's very interesting that you know, we think you know literacy is very important. Our parents are very concerned with literacy, but you know we 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 find that you know with working through uh, with working with children and listening to children, children really are interested in literacy. Uh, but here's the way where you know the the learning is very internalized by the children. You know letters have a written, you know they have identity, they have uh, special meaning, they have materials that are connected to them, and so all this wonderful learning that. I think to me is much richer than just sort of a top-down didactic model of learning the ABC. Uh, they could be memorizing, but, but are they really learning you know, about letters? I think this is uh, a great example of how there's all kinds of learning connected to literacy. So at that point when the children were exploring the idea of light and shadow and the alphabet, it's important to note that the teachers had a, a commercial alphabet up on their wall. Um, so that's, that's how the children were looking at the alphabet at that time, right? And then they started having this experience by finding these various objects in the classroom and putting them together to recreate alphabets or the letters. So the teachers decided it might be interesting to put all of these letters together and create a new alphabet that was actually developed by the children. So the first form of documentation that they created was actually a mini panel. Um, and they called it the shadow alphabet. And this mini panel was placed out in the hallway so that a number of other children in the school could see the letters that, that this classroom had made. But then they didn't stop there with the documentation. They went further. And they created another form or another way to be able to share the experiences that had taken place. And by that, they took down the commercial alphabet that they had in their classroom and they replaced it with these shadow letters that the children had made. And there's just a close-up. On the right, the, the K is actually made out of different cars and trucks, which is kind of fun, and the I is also. So just thinking about all of these interesting objects that they went around the room to try and find and figure out how they could use these shapes to recreate a letter. And then the teachers created a mini book of the shadow letters. So if we think about all the different types of documentation that they gathered for this, right, that would be the dialogue, the photographs, um, some of the actual work that the children had done. They then took all of that, that loose documentation, and they created three different ways that they displayed or shared this work with the rest of the school community. Again, one being the small mini panel in the hallway, one being the replacement of the commercial alphabet in the classroom, and then the third being this, this book or binder of the shadow letters. Um, so with that, um, we're going to move from all of these inspirational experiences with children and these, these images, these beautiful images of light and shadow, and we're going to ask you to go into your own school building or context and, and participate in a small exploration of light and shadow. So here is the... Uh you know, the provocation, if you will, the nuts and bolts of um, what we're asking you to do. So it's a 10-minute, first 10-minute uh, exploration. Uh, explore your own school or building. Look for interesting shadows. Uh, choose, choose the one that is, I've lost my notes. <laughs> <laughs> the most interesting to you? Yeah, choose the one that's most interesting <laughs> to you and use black markers to represent um, yeah. <laughs> so we, we also have samples of the materials here that we're asking you to use for this experience. So um, Sharpie marker or a different type of black marker. Um, paper. Any size paper, small paper, larger paper, marker. And then we also had mentioned in the, the email, I think, that was sent out previously, that if you had flashlights or different light sources, I don't know which way I need to go to see them, <laughs> different light sources that you'd like to bring in to be able to manipulate uh, shadows or create your own shadows as well, you can do that. So, so after this experience, uh, it is a five minute reflection. So you can I? Oh, hmm? okay. No, it's the oh, okay. Yeah. Drawing it. Hey, Susie, would you like to draw a shadow somewhere? Sure. Well, why don't you find an interesting shadow Ooh. in the room, right? Yeah. This is, you know, how about, let's see. I'm going to get my lovely assistant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to create a beautiful mm -hmm. shape. Mm -hmm. 
some of that stack. Can you guys move up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this can start off as a um, um, something gestural and abstract. Sometimes children will create something from, from this image here. I think I'm done tracing. Okay. If I can add also, you don't necessarily have to make a shadow that you project on the paper to trace. Right. You can also find a shadow in the space mm -hmm. and just use the paper to represent what you see. It doesn't necessarily have to be a tracing. What Jesus right. demonstrated is one possibility. Um, and so then, the, you know, the follow-up is a five-minute reflection uh, with a return to the large group and reflect on your experience. I think this is a great time to, to document, to gather children's theories, their ideas, their thoughts, and their feelings, um, and can further uh, inform what you will be for me um, as a subsequent experience. So for right now, they're just taking 10 minutes to kind of find some kind of interesting light or shadow in their environment. Right. And often you can find it's just this, it's, they're there every day. Mm -hmm. We just aren't don't see them or pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. And the last piece of that is um, we had also mentioned if you have any cameras available at your center, that it would be great if somebody would be able to go and document or photograph some of um, those who are exploring and finding the shadow while they're doing so, and some of the interesting shadows that might be discovered. You can also use your handy iPhone or yeah. smartphone. <laughs> and actually, there's a light. There's a flashlight on iPhones oh, also yeah, that yeah. you can yeah. use um, if yeah. you need to create your own yeah. shadow. Yeah. So we'll take 10 minutes now yeah. and come back at, what is it, 10 after? Yes, 10 okay, after. So we'll come back at 2.20 at Central Time, right? <laughs> yeah. So 10 minutes from now. OK. Any yeah. questions before we sign and before we let you go do that? questions right now here. Okay. Okay. All right.
Okay, so we're back now, and you're back, mm -hmm. and so we want to find out from you uh, if you can send us your comments, uh, if you have anything since you've had this time to experience, maybe something uh, in your office, in your classroom, uh, let us know how the experience was for you. Eileen says, hi, Karen. Eileen <laughs> <laughs> um, says, I'm wondering about the timeline for being able to implement, given the holidays and school closures. Are there expectations as to frequency with implementing provocations? So when you say that, can they hear you? Yeah, okay. they're, they're hearing you. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, I think that's a great question, and that's why I talked about at the beginning this being kind of a, a time crunch, um, because usually you wouldn't be proposing something like this right before the holidays, but we have to because of this time span for the exhibit at the National Historic Con Conference. Um, so one thing might be helpful is to think about how to plan out, because you, you could say you're going to do all this stuff and then you get really busy and you just put it on the back burner and then you don't get it done. So how can you figure out a way to have regular provocations and continually work on this project over the next couple months? And the problem is, I mean, we can't give a recipe or a formula on how to do that. You're going to have to figure that out. But we are going to go through some things in the next PowerPoint that make some suggestions and give some ideas on things to pursue. I have another uh, okay. comment from uh, Kathy Jackson. Mm -hmm. When I walked into the classroom, there was a child building blocks. The blocks cast the <laughs> shadow <laughs> on the Great. table. The child had not noticed the shadow until I started drawing the shadow of the block no. and the shadow of the child's hand. When the child asked about my drawing, she began to notice the shadow and began building to produce New shadow images. Wow, that's great. What a great story. And one thing that we were also talking about here is if we could if we could even get some examples of some of the things you drew or or you just kind of some of the dialogue or your reflections about the experience. Because we want to have some documentation of the beginning of this project. And or even photograph the shadows that you found yeah. in your environment. So we even photograph. And at the end, we're going to give you um, an email address to send anything to us. And it, uh, you know, we don't want this to be a real big deal. You could just scan a drawing. You could just send us a photograph. You could write a couple sentences about your experience and just send it to us. And that would be great for, for a beginning. But thank you for sharing that. Yeah. We have another comment um, from Cindy Hayer. Uh, having a light source made finding an interesting shadow easier plus I could trans I could transform the shadow. Mm -hmm. I also found that found that I really wanted to share what I found with someone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When it came to drawing the shadow I wanted someone to hold the light. Yeah. <laughs> so that brings up this idea of with someone else to think about, you know, I'm not I'm not sure whether whether many of you are doing this alone or you're doing this with a team or you're doing this in collaboration with someone. But it would be great if you could find somebody to collaborate with in terms of doing this. Even if it's two teachers from two different centers or two different programs. But to be communicating with each other and sharing over time. Because I think that's an important point, that idea that you, you found something and you wanted to talk with somebody about it. You wanted to share it. You wanted to think about it with somebody together. I think, yeah, I, I would say consider having a light source that's present all the time. You know, like, uh, an overhead projector. I know that seems like a, uh, a dated instrument, but uh, we find that for light and shadows, it's a wonderful yeah. tool, and it produces such beautiful light. So consider um, how your environment might be arranged in a way that provides these kinds of experiences more frequently. Uh, Jamie Tyler has a comment. She says she loves this idea. She's excited to share this with uh, my staff tomorrow and ask them to get on board with it. I think light and shadows are something we don't think of often as a learning topic. Great. One, th one other additional thing I wanted to say, too, um, 
is when, when Jesus was talking about the overhead projector, overhead projectors are wonderful to use with like two-year-olds, yeah. one-year-olds. You know, I mean, no, those, those younger, because sometimes people think, oh, you can't do stuff with the younger kids because they don't talk. Um, even though they communicate in many, many different ways. And so to keep that kind of tool um, in mind is a provocation for that younger age. One thing that I did when I was in the classroom, my classroom actually explored light and shadows, and I made flashlights a part of the environment. So I had a basket of flashlights ready for children just to use on a daily basis. And um, partway through that experience, Home Depot also donated lights to us as well. Mm -hmm. So if funding is an issue, you can find a source to you know, donate to your experiences. You know, to add on to that too, when we talk about provocation, provocation doesn't always have to be a teacher asking a question or a teacher making a comment. It can be something you set up in the environment. Like if two-year-olds walked into their classroom one day and there was a huge basket of flashlights and nobody said anything. You know, so there, there are things that you could set up in terms of equipment or tools or materials in the environment that automatically provoke children to explore, pursue, you know, experiment, um, react to. So keep that in mind in terms of provocation. I don't know how much your question is. Great comment. Great. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so we're going to move to the mm -hmm. final PowerPoint where we're kind of talking about what we're going to do. And that's the one that says guidance. Do we have one more comment here? No. I hope that I'm able to download some of my pictures to you. I discovered a beautiful image of our center's garden through an outside window reflection. Oh. Parents and staff, parents and staff started in to get in, get in on my experience, and a four-person shadow picture was taken. I kept saying, I kept saying, I am in a web class right now. <laughs> when everyone wanted to keep the experience going. <laughs> Yeah, we really want to see some of the beginning examples of the exploration. The other thing I guess I wanted to say about this exploration with you is it's really, it, it's important at this work to, to have some, for the adults who are working with the children, to have some beginning exploration um, themselves, either in, in researching something or actually actively exploring with something. So you can kind of get on the same track in some ways as the children as you both learn together. You may not be learning the same things, but you are both learning together uh, about the learning process, but also whatever the, the focus area is that you're exploring. I, I think to add to that, I think one of the things that, that's what Karen just said, um, one of the reasons why I love working in early childhood is, and I think many of us do, is the, uh, it sort of allows us to reenter the world that we once belonged, yeah. <laughs> that we once were a part of. Yeah. And I think that it's so incredible to see, uh, to have the experience of asking ourselves these questions again, you know, seeing the shadow, seeing the way a child processes these things, you know, and really trying to get into their mind, you know, what, what questions they have, what theories they have, what feelings they have. Um, so all that just to add to what uh, Karen was talking about, exploring alongside the children, I think, is this will allow us uh, to do that, to re-enter this world. I think another thing as adults, when we start to look at ideas of light and shadow, it can really transform the way that we see our environment around mm -hmm. us. From very, very simple things that maybe we never noticed, all of a sudden become really, really important or magical or special, right? Mm -hmm. So it can really change um, our perception of the things around us. Just an example of what somebody, I can't remember who, who wrote in and talked about the block and seeing the shadow on there. Mm -hmm. but. Pardon me, Cindy. Um, it's a perfect example of probably if she hadn't been looking for that, she wouldn't have seen it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it just it kind of opens up your eyes to seeing things that you wouldn't pay attention to before. Okay. Uh, Leah, okay. Leah Sanders said, "Hi, Karen." <laughs> <laughs> Hello. We have, uh, we have gotten old X-ray readers put up vertically on the wall. Oh. I have two classrooms ready to participate. Oh, great. Wow. Right. Wow. Okay, those are all the comments that we have for now. Okay.
Okay, so talking a little bit more, Janice is going to read, and usually I would say on a PowerPoint we don't put this, this many words, but because we know you can download this and use this information, we are, you know, and don't have access to handouts, that's why we're putting so many words on PowerPoint. So one shadow can create its own identity or personality. And so much of this information is what we've been talking about. Uh, and so when you're thinking about children and shadow, uh, children see this both as real and unreal. And it moves, dances, and changes the uh, shade or shape. But it does not speak in words. What makes exploring with these materials so different is that unlike other materials, light and shadow cannot be held in the palm of your hand. Light, darkness, and shadow can show us new aspects about shape and scale of familiar objects like a toy, uh, a piece of cloth, a person, or even a person's drawing. Uh, new discoveries with light allow children to see ordinary objects in a new way. In addition, exploring light gives us the challenge of altering classroom environments to support discoveries with such items as overhead projectors, slides, flashlights, light tables, all of the examples that we've uh, been showing throughout uh, this webinar. Light and shadows allow us to study the passage of time. For example, the uh, Anasazi, I'm sorry, used shadows to record what time of the year it was on a stone slab. Light and shadows allow something to be put into focus or brought attention to. For example, a beam of light on an object that makes it stand out. So teacher preparation. So uh, what we want is for us to begin thinking about all those possibilities that you'll be able uh, to present uh, as a team, research, artists, and groups of people who have used lights and shadow, uh, thinking about before working with children and exploring shadow select different ways of viewing or producing light. Um, and so, you know, just really kind of thinking about and coming up with questions uh, as you start to pursue light and shadow. Okay. So, so basically this kind of beginning part is you exploring yourself. You've done a little bit of it today, and maybe you could do a little bit more of it with a colleague or with a team if you're talking about it in the future. We can go to the next one. So we're going to throw out some possibilities. And, and the, the problem is some of you may have worked with light and shadows before. Some of you may have not. Everyone's kind of in a different place. So we're throwing out provocations or possibilities or challenges for you to pursue. And you're going to have to decide yourself as what you want to pursue. I think what the most important part of this all is to choose something to pursue. And I would suggest when Eileen was saying, you know, what about some kind of timeline, maybe to think about doing something each week. You know, if you, if you need some kind of way to, to break it up. Um, and, you know, and then carefully choosing kind of which day and who's going to do what becomes very important because if you forget those logistics, it just kind of falls to the wayside and doesn't get done. But so here are some possibilities when exploring and working with children for exploring natural and artificial life. D discuss and document conversations about where shadows come from. Record sunlight and shadows at different times of the day. Document light and shadows during different weather. Document light and shadows at home and at school. How might they appear differently or the same? Record light and shadows during different routines at home and school. These are all different kinds of ways that you can be intentional and strategic about exploring light and shadow. And the example that I used earlier that I implemented into my classroom, perhaps on today's Thursday, 
perhaps on Monday you can have a basket <laughs> of different light sources in your room and document how children respond to them. And that could be your the way you initiate this experience with children. And, and when we're suggesting some of these things, think about this as being a beginning. You're, you're going you're gonna to begin with this, and then that documentation, when you look at it, review it, see what children say, see how children react, see how children pursue it, that's going to give you ideas on where to go next with it. So in terms of exploring shadows, search for shadows in a building. Discuss how shadows are the same or different than an act than an actual than actual object. Create drawings, paintings, or even three-dimensional objects that reflect ideas and beliefs about shadows. Examine people's shadows by projecting them on a screen. Look at shadows of familiar objects projected on a screen. Make shadows that move and are still. Can shadows dance together? Can shadows chase each other? How do shadows move around the room and over furniture? Trace shadows of people or objects. And then exploring with other tools in manufactured or artificial light. Um, think about using an overhead projector, which we've talked about before, or screen to create shadows of people or objects. Explore the use of objects that are flat, ones that build upwards, or objects of different colors. Draw on transparency. Project the drawing on the wall or another surface. Make a new shadow or object on transparency. Can children locate and touch it on the wall? Two-year-olds especially love doing that. They don't even do Explore with light and shadow, with flashlights. Can the beam be put down to the floor, up to the ceiling, or up to the wall? Can it race all around the room fast? Can it move all around the room very slowly? So, Christian, I was thinking maybe you could say a couple of things here and focus on the documentation. Okay, I'm going to read through this. Yeah, sure. Okay. So thinking about these experiences that you might be having in the classroom or with children, parents, teachers, um, thinking about documenting the whole way along, right? All of the photographs that you're collecting, all of the dialogue that you're collecting, this isn't something that we're just going to collect one day and then put to the side. This is going to be an ongoing collection of documentation that you'll have. So in thinking about documenting, we think about documenting the following, different shadows that children see and point out various light sources children view, various ways children create shadows or explore with light sources, documenting children's dialogue about light or about shadows, collecting children's representations of light and shadow, drawings, paintings, etc. Develop some kind of system to gather and organize documentation, thinking about what you're going to do when you have all of these loose pieces of data or all these loose pieces of documentation coming at you. How are you going to put them together so that you can keep them organized for yourself? Some people might find that a file for each child works really well. Some people just like a file folder that they put all of their drawings in one section, all the dialogue in another section. Some people use a holding board or a work in progress board in their classroom so that the information is visible to visitors in the classroom as well as the children. So just thinking about what system would work best for you. And let me just interject and say, this is the one where people have a lot of trouble and get challenged because you get you just start collecting everything and you get totally overwhelmed and then you just get lost and kind of freeze up because you don't know what to do. So try to figure out a system as soon as possible. And also keep in mind that you do not have to collect every single thing because if you do, you will get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Think of it in terms of collecting samples of things. You know, um, you don't have to get every single drawing that that child made that day. It could be one drawing. You know, so to keep that in mind, otherwise you do get overwhelmed. And some of this is, is tangible documentation, right, that we have, and then some of it's electronic. Mm -hmm. So if you're downloading digital images, how are you going to organize that as well? What, what system are you going to come up with with folders? How are you going to label those folders? Because again, in the same way that the tangible or hard, you know, hard copies can get very disorganized, so can the electronic copies of things. Um, so lastly, just documenting adult reflections or questions about the experiences with children as well. So you as, as teachers, as site directors or whatnot, um, being able to write down and uh, capture your own reflections or those that you're speaking with. And I, I would say when you are reflecting, thinking about some of your reflections or your moments or thoughts about things to be interjected into the experiences with children, I think that 
right here, maybe when we're thinking about reflections, you're talking about what you wonder or what you want to know more. I think that you can ask children those same things. What do you want to know more about? Mm -hmm. Is there something about shadows you can tell me? Those types of questions or reflective moments are, are equally as important. Okay, and then thinking about the different types of documentation that you might collect throughout this process, and this is just um, this is a list of examples that we put together for possibilities. So thinking about photographs, photographs of a child, photographs of professional development experiences, so the experiences that you're having today, exploring the light and shadow, teachers' workshops, teachers and children um, working together, small group work, maybe even photographs of parents and children working together. Drawings are two-dimensional work, collaborative drawings, small group drawings, teacher reflections, adult reflections, or even as Kim was talking about, three-dimensional work, recorded conversations among teachers, administrators, etc., as well as dialogue or conversations had by the children. When we talk about dialogue or conversations, we're talking about the authentic conversations that the children are having, so it's their exact words, not paraphrased. So this was a form that was made up that we're, we're telling people if they want to use this to help them in terms of planning what they're going to do. And it's not that we're, we're holding people to it and they have to, you know, whatever they wrote out, they have to do exactly that. But it, it gives you kind of a guide and it gives you a sense of what you're going to work on and where you're going to go. And so this format is going to be made available for people to use if, if you download it. And then I think, I think that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So at this point, we want to see if there are any more questions. And then we also want to share um, the, the email address you can use to contact us if you have questions or if you want to send us some of your beginning um, documentation of, of some of your drawings and your experiences or some of your photographs. I guess one thing I wanted to say too, some of the things that we threw out, it might seem kind of like overwhelming. So it's really more about looking at this as a menu. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to choose to pick out and work on? Don't at all try to do all these things. No. Please. <laughs> no, you can make it really simple. Yeah. Uh, the um, example that uh, Kim shared with just a basket of flashlights. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just something simple that can be brought into the environment. But just really take it one step at a time and not think that you have to do it all. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you get into it and you start having conversations with your uh, children, you might find that there are other things that they are thinking about in regards to light and shadow that will uh, have you go in a different direction. And that's okay, too. So uh, just making uh, the opportunity very simple at the start is, I think, the way to go. And I think, too, you know, say to yourself, I don't have to do it all, but I have to do something. I think it's important to, to think in, in both, of, both of those ways. And I would just echo what Kristen said earlier about organizing yourself. I think that if you don't, you will stress yourself out, which will yeah. kind of, in some ways, be imposed on children. So really, if you can organize yourself the best way possible, I would really take that as the first piece of guidance to this experience is to find your, a, a way to organize yourself. And again, if people feel like you're, you're getting stuck or you're not sure about something, really feel free to email us questions. Because I know that happens sometimes with teachers. They're not quite sure what to do next. No questions so far. Okay. Okay, um, I'd like to first of all thank our uh, presenters. I think that and all of you out there who joined us on our first round. Um, 
I think this is very exciting. And I think the one thing I want to say um, um, about it being Head Start. This is our 50th anniversary. And we've been a leader for 50 years. And we want to make sure that we continue to lead. This is our opportunity to really continue to do the best practice that we know out there for children. Uh, I think as we listen to the, the, the way that we're talking about this work, it really sounds like Head Start. And it's a place where we should be. And um, we really want to encourage. So if you have friends and colleagues out there who didn't join us for the first time, please. Um, reach out to them. Let them know that we would be happy for them to come along this journey with us mm -hmm. because we are Head Start. Uh, this is important that children deserve these opportunities. Uh, there are things that other children in uh, little riskier places mm -hmm. have always had opportunity, and our children deserve the very best. And we know this is at the top of the list. So please take this opportunity that's being offered to you um, and our children deserve it. Mm -hmm. Looking for our next 50 years, and uh, this will set us off in the right direction. The team, as, they said, as I said, will be available to you. Uh, any other closing comments, et cetera, I just wanted to do my little head start rah-rah. And uh, let Karen and Janet uh, do the final. We have a few comments. Oh, good. Uh, Kathy Jackson, I am very excited about this project. Thank you for the provocation for education, edu educators. This is going to be great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the email address, I, I sent it to everybody, uh, but I can type it again. It is support at crossroads, Chicago, Reggio org, And you should see that pop up in your screen right about now. Panel, you may not realize it, but you all have an awesome shadow presentation going on. <laughs> <laughs> that is from Linda Bell. These are such nice comments. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. We were wondering if you could pull up the first presentation that Karen did. Sure. Just a particular slide. We, we're trying to pull up the slide with the future date. It's over. We want to just revisit that so you can see those future dates. Uh, yes, but it's I think slide number eight. It, is it the green yeah, one? So as you can see, today we're meeting today, 11:20, 12:16. Um, I know it's getting close to the to the holidays, but also we think it's important to keep things going. That we have a meeting on 12:16, um, and then we're going to have two in January, one on January 15th, January 29th, and then a final meeting February 12th. So you can see how fast this is. That's why I was saying it maybe keeps something going every week. Um, so that will be our next webinar, uh, December 16th. And I was just thinking, too, as we're nearing the holidays, there are going to be more festive oh, decorations, yeah. right? Which will fit perfectly in. <laughs> <like Whoa. to laughs> yeah, keep that in mind. Okay, so I think I think that's everything. I think it is. Oh, one last question. Are the times of the webinar the same? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank Again, you so thank much. Thank you very much. Goodbye, thank everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.